Hi, and welcome to the Impact Show on fintech.tv. Um, I'm joined today by Swami Venkataraman from Moody's. He is the Senior Vice President of Environmental, Social, and Governance Group and manages the development of ESG analytical tools, assessments, and the integration of ESG considerations into Moody's credit ratings. During Climate Week, we spoke with Swami and we were looking at all the issues around climate change, but at the same time, they put out a request for comment on proposed ESG scores for all rated issuers. So we're here to discuss that today. Swami, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me, Jess. Oh, it's my pleasure, really. So the, the first thing I just want to say to our audience is that we've been talking really for about two years that whether you're following the science around climate change or not, the issue is that rating agencies, credit agencies, and insurance companies are starting to look at really pricing in or really rating the physical risks around climate change and the transition risks. Talk to me about Moody's and where we're at right now with these proposed changes. Yeah, Jeff, I think this is a trend that has been uh, certainly gathering steam for the last few years. Um, and in some ways, it even goes beyond uh, carbon transition and physical risk to encompass even broadly ESG. Uh, we've seen many social considerations become important in the context of now the coronavirus pandemic that's, that's ongoing as well. Um, and if you look at the trend over the past several years, today we're talking about almost $30 trillion of debt globally that's managed under some form of sustainable or responsible investing mandate. That, that's the details might vary, but that's a big number. And that number is continues to grow really fast. Um, in the US alone, that number has doubled in the last four or five years. Um, and Moody's as a whole is responding to these changes, these demands from investors in the market. Um, our own strategy consists of both a rating agency aspect to it, as well as a non-rating agency aspect to it. Uh, as a rating agency, uh, we are focused more on the credit and the credit implications of all these uh, all these uh, uh, risks. Um, and then outside of the rating agency, we also have made investments, uh, committed a lot of resources, um, acquiring entities such as BGO Iris uh, uh, 427, which provides climate analytics data, um, and then setting up a broader business that looks beyond credit and into maybe a broader uh, stakeholder perspective as well on, on ESG matters. Um, I'm going to speak to you more on the credit aspect of things uh, and Moody's Investor Service Rating Agency. Um, and that's part of the same strategy where investors want more transparency on how ESG affects credit. Investors uh, are asking us to provide more uh, data, more research, um, and today we are talking about the, the request for comment that you mentioned is essentially a proposal from us that we will be publishing two types of scores, ESG scores, that will uh, meet the market demands in this area. Can you give us a breakdown of what the two type of scores really look like? <clears throat> sure. So um, the, the, the two types are, one, one type of score is called a profile score. And what it does is it really speaks to the profile of the issuer, the ESG profile of the issuer. Um, what sort of risks are they facing? Um, and this is over the long term as well. We are not simply talking about the next few years. We're talking about the very long term out looking through a few decades as well. What sort of risks is the issuer facing? And also what sort of actions is management taking to accommodate or to manage through these risks? So it briefly, it broadly speaks to the ESG uh, profile of the issuer. Um, but what we are proposing is that we are, we are planning to show not just one score, but rather an environmental profile, a social profile, and a governance profile of a given issue. So this speaks to just the ESG issues, but what are the exposures and what's management sort of doing about it as well. And then there's the other type of score, which we are calling a credit impact score, where what we do is we are what we recognize that ESG is not the only thing that goes into a rating. There are whole sorts of other issues, industry specific issues, non ESG issues, right? So what we want to say is, okay, you've talked about all these ESG profiles, but how did they impact the rating? What has been the impact on the rating itself? Did, is the rating higher because they have ESG strengths 
or is the rating lower uh, because they have a lot of risks um, in their profile? So that's the other kind of score. We are calling it a credit impact score. So we are proposing to publish profile scores, which speak broadly to the risks and opportunities, and a credit impact score that speak to how these scores affect credit rating at the end of the day. I'm curious, you talked about the acquisition of the Geo Iris, and uh, they obviously push out their own ESG scores. How do you differentiate? Will these be blended into what you're doing with the Geo Iris, or will they remain two different separate scoring methodologies and That's systems? That's a great question, Jeff. Um, we do contemplate at this time that they will remain separate scores, uh, primarily because um, they serve different purposes. Um, our own scores are focused on credit and credit impact only. Whereas VE's uh, scores serve multiple purposes, other purposes, uh, they, they take an equity perspective as well. They also can uh, provide a broader uh, perspective of multiple stakeholders, say from the perspective of the society, from community, from the community and so on. So it's a broader um, approach um, that they have. Uh, they also have other issues. They may provide products for people creating ESG indices, for example, and so on. So, so it's the it's the focus and the customer base that's a, that's different for the two products. So we do think they will uh, they will have two different different methodologies, and they would continue to exist separately. What is common though is that we are hoping that there is some underlying data that Vigio Iris has been collecting for many years now, and will continue to collect. We are hoping to take advantage of that data in producing our own scores to the extent that data is related to the environmental performance of companies and that's relevant to what we are looking at as well. So you sent out comment letters. Have you received the comments back yet? And I'm curious between asset owners, investors, give us an idea of the audience that you went out to for the comment period. Yeah, you, you got the two most important categories, asset owners, investors. Uh, the third one would be um, issuers that we rate um, who are interested in what sort of ESG scores they might receive. And the fourth uh, would be um, really anybody else who is a stakeholder in this broad ESG process. That could include regulators. It could include uh, groups like the uh, UNPRI um, and sort of all the other groups that you know who are interested in ESG and what's happening uh, to the ESG. In, 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 but basically, it's open to pretty much everybody, but these are the uh, most important um, uh, stakeholders, if people, the people who are most interested. Can you give us an example, like literally walk us through a change where we might see on a specific credit instrument? You know, are we looking at a particular bond that the rating might change because of these risks? Have you gotten nervous feedback from asset owners um, because of these issues? I'm curious what the comments have looked like. Yeah, that is a very popular question in the sense that people really want to know. Um, so one thing I would say is the introduction of these scores in and of themselves will not change ratings, right? Because these scores are only a reflection or a provide transparency into what it is that we have analyzed in coming up with a rating and how we factored into our analysis. So they are a, more of a transparency exercise, if you will. They, they, they tell the market, look, this is what we think of this issuer in terms of their uh, ESG profile. And this is exactly how it affected the rating. Uh, so the scores themselves will not, but clearly ESG issues do affect ratings. Um, there are a number of examples, uh, both positive and negative. Let me mention one of each just for illustration. Please. Um, negatively, we, um, we have, uh, and let's ignore Corona for now, right? Coronavirus has affected so many ratings. That's so broad based. But something more pointed, we have down, uh, uh, downgraded um, some auto manufacturers even before uh, the advent of the coronavirus. And you can look at some of our rating actions in September of last year um, on Ford Motor Company, for example, as an example, um, where we did highlight some of the challenges they faced, um, uh, such as maybe that they may have to pay fines in Europe uh, because they cannot meet their emission uh, requirements. Um, and also, they don't yet have a credible platform to manufacture electric vehicles. They're, they're working towards those things, but they have a sort of a weakness there. And that comes uh, as the company's broader business is also, you know, undergoing a big restructuring plan and so on. So we prominently alluded to certain environmental factors um, in that downgrade. More recently, this is just a week ago, we actually upgraded the Brazilian mining company, Vale. And, and Ballet, as you know, actually was in the midst of an ESG controversy uh, a couple of years ago. 
one of their dams collapsed, um, destroying pretty much, many, killing many workers and pretty much destroying the immediate community living around the dam. Uh, it was a big ESG uh, negative. We did downgrade the company back then. Um, and what we've done is we've since taken cognizance of all the different actions that management has taken in terms of um, moving away from even using those kinds of dams and moving to other kinds of dams that are known to be safer um, and then putting in place a whole new system of managing the safety of these dams, um, going uh, also governance practices, uh, clearly having senior positions, hiring senior positions to manage these risks, reporting directly to the board of directors. And I'll point you to our press release and credit opinion that goes into a lot more detail but what we what that's a, that's an illustration that even if you did have problems, management can address those problems in a credible manner, in a manner that does affect their credit rating. So I, I would point to both of those. I think in future, what you would see is that these scores that we are planning to introduce, they would reflect these things. Um, so if we downgrade somebody because of ESG, we would probably say, hey, your rating is lower than it would otherwise be in the absence of ESG issues. Therefore, you're getting a low uh, a credit impact score from us. That score will, will reflect that. So that transparency, that extra transparency is what these scores will bring. Swami, well, I just want to ask the tough question because I think the marketplace feels a little bit oversaturated with ESG data these days. And a lot of the ESG data companies are kind of a black box. We really don't know where these scores are coming from, where they're gathering their information from. So I want to give you an opportunity to really explain why is this different with Moody's? Is there more transparency? Is there a benefit to end investors? Is the data more freely available? What are some of the reasons why Moody's decided to come to market with ESG scores in this environment? Okay, great. So I, I would say, I would, I, would, I would answer that, I would say a couple of different things in response to that, right? First, why these scores themselves? Um, um, I, I alluded to the demand from our customers, our investors, fundamentally why we need to do that. Um, but why Moody's? Um, I think we have established a, a reputation along multiple uh, ways. One is in our ability to cover a very large number of issues uh, globally. Uh, very few ESG data providers can match the kind of coverage that Moody's has. Uh, we have over 30,000 ratings, 30 something thousand ratings across the world, across different types of sectors. Um, uh, and oftentimes each issuer has multiple ratings as well. I'm not even counting that. So there's a very large number. So simply the breadth of our coverage is very difficult for people to match. Um, secondly, it's not just about the breadth of coverage. It's also about a track record of being able to do this in a systematic consistent manner and apply a uniform methodology globally and a methodology that we are able to publish and have it be very transparent, right? That's the second most important. Um, the third most important reason why Moody's actually speaks to one of the questions you raised, which is about the profusion of ESG data companies. Um, the common weakness among all of them is it, it actually is, it relates to an issue that is broadly recognized, which is that disclosures are not really very good on the ESG space. Um, uh, the, the, uh, there's not much standardized disclosure available. And um, most ESG data providers are operating out of minimal disclosure, trying to do the best they can. Others have said, okay, I'm going to try and leverage artificial intelligence to try and glean signals from news items in the market to see what I can learn about ESG. The big advantage that Moody's has is that we have a relationship with companies, with issuers. We have the ability to access material non-public information that we routinely use in coming up with our credit ratings. And that's a big advantage that we have in that we can reach out to issuers and access non-public information should that be needed in arriving at these scores as well. So that superior access to data when married with a very broad reach um, a 1500, uh, 12 to 1500 base of analysts globally, um, and our long track record of many decades of doing this kind of analysis, I think really distinguishes our products from the others in the market. When can people expect this data to be published? Um, I think what we are looking at is uh, right now, we've asked the market for feedback. Um, we expect that the market will critique and say, well, we like this, we don't like that aspect of how you're doing it and so on. 
um, we need to really digest that uh, feedback that might take uh, uh, you know a couple of months where we where we uh, receive that feedback make some changes if needed to the methodology itself publish a final methodology and then um, eventually uh, what we're looking to is a launch scores if you look at the what we publish right now we published a detailed appendix for sovereigns uh, as part of that and sovereigns is hence likely to be the first of our sectors to be published. Uh, there's already a very detailed framework for sovereigns. How are we going to come up with these scores? Um, and so you should expect to see countries having ESG scores to begin with. And then over the course of next year, we hope to scale. Um, we don't have a plan that we have announced clearly, but I think broadly um, we are expecting to substantially scale up and cover most of our rated universe uh, in 2021. Take us a little bit into the future, especially in results around climate change. Do you think that these scores will continue to evolve as the data comes in and the science becomes more clear even than it is currently? Absolutely, Jeff. I think that's definitely going to happen. And it may, it may not even be as much that the science evolves, which it will, um, and there would be more data on climate um, that, that will back up all the... Like, we've seen how actual occurrences have... Um, if not backed up, uh, sometimes been even more extreme than even what scientists have predicted, like the wildfires in California, for example. People knew they were a risk. Uh, it was one of the items that we, but nobody expected how soon they would arrive and in what severe a manner they would arrive. Um, but the more important change I expect over time is that um, companies will recognize the importance of this simply because all their stakeholders, their investors, their shareholders want greater disclosure. And we are, I think we are going to see better and better disclosure. Potentially, maybe some standards will get adopted widely. I, I'm not able to predict that um, um, if a particular standard will win over. But I, I feel pretty certain that you're going to see much better disclosure. And that will, that will actually be good for everybody uh, because the anal analysis around EST will just get better. Well, I mean, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. I want people to be on the lookout and please respond to the comment period with Moody's so that we can have an excellent product hitting the market. And I want to thank you for your leadership in this space. It's been a pleasure speaking with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Always a pleasure to be with you.